Welcome to Live Players, where political scientist and strategist Samo Berja and I discuss the key individuals with the power to alter our current society. Every week, we provide analysis of the news, technology developments, politics, and the direction of the future through the lens of Live Players. Let's dive in. Samo, welcome to our first episode of our new podcast, Live Players. Really excited to excited to do this with you. I'm excited to get this uh, started. So let's give a brief background as to as to the term uh, "live players." It's a term you've uh, you, you've coined and you're, you're, uh, you've popularized. W- w- why don't you unpack the significance of of that term and wh- why the inspiration for the podcast? Yeah, um, the most basic observation is that nearly everyone is following conventions, right? You follow conventions and pre-designed scripts in your life, uh, be it through the educational process, be it following the standards of your industry. And for the most part, these conventions are in place for good reasons, right? You don't necessarily want uh, your doctor improvising your treatment. Well, that is until you do, until you do have a rare condition uh, that's not common and that's not well covered by the literature. So the vast majority of society uh, is not uh, improvising, right? They're not very good at coming up with new uh, processes, new, new ways of doing things on the fly. Honestly, they're not even that good at evaluating evidence. There's plenty of empirical evidence for this poor quality of our ability to evaluate evidence on the fly. Massive literature, uh, you know, some of it even replicates uh, in the cognitive science field and the biases literature and so on, uh, but also just, you know, day to day experience. Um, so, why? you know, live players, right? People who actually are always thinking from first principles, they're remarkably rare in society. Um, But one of the best ways to sort of spot such individuals uh, is people who easily and successfully jump multiple domains through the course of their life. So, you know, a classic example I like to give is, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, it's a fun example because it's someone who uh, basically goes AOL uh, from the Austrian military to win a bodybuilding competition and then goes back to his commanding officer arguing that, you know, since I won the bodybuilding competition, uh, you know, actually this is good for our military unit morale and you shouldn't punish me. So classic example of sort of asking, you know, for forgiveness rather than permission. And we all know, right? Like everyone was like, okay, you know, he's just a bodybuilder. He's appearing in documentary. And then everyone's saying he's not a real actor. Uh, once he becomes famous with movies like the Terminator and so on, of course, once he becomes a politician, you, you say, oh, he's not a real politician. He's an actor. Um, and if he were interested I'm sure he could even return today and just be a tech CEO of a major company. Like if he shows up in Silicon Valley and started fundraising for an AI company, yeah, come exactly. on, who wouldn't take that? Who wouldn't <laughs> take that investment? CEO of OpenAI, perhaps? <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I mean, the position <laughs> is changing hands so rapidly. You know, I feel like he would be understood to be a determined and tough leader and probably take safety seriously, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, we're we're going to get into the, the Sam Altman thing in a second, but but first, just because it is the first episode, let, let's give a little bit more background on you. You're you're a live player, if if I could if I could uh, you know say so myself. You're um, you're both a historian or academic, uh, intellectual, but also a, a practitioner in in that you uh, are interested in, in applied insights, and you have a consulting practice, uh, Bismarck which consults some of the biggest live players uh, around the world about how, how they can uh, you know, develop and exercise th- their power to achieve th- their goals and make the impact that they want to make. But w- what more background should you, uh, uh, sh- sh- should you give on, on um, sort of how, how you think about yourself, if there are any uh, an analogs or, or people that you most admire historically that, that resonate, uh, demonstrate the impact you seek to have? Yeah, I uh, believe basically that you know, the deep reality of history, in other words, Uh, not only do we need to know history to understand our own current society, because our current society is just one data point. And in the very near future, this present moment, this society we think of as our practical present will be the past. To think about the future, you need the past data points. You need the snapshot of, say, I don't know, American society in 1995, 1965, 1865, 1765, and not just American society, right, but all the other societies and how they progress 
through these classical stages. So that's the first, the first takeaway. It's societal, but the other takeaway is personal. I honestly think that, you know, you don't need historical knowledge to be a live player. Like you almost don't need it. However, it sure does help to know that other human beings have achieved remarkable things. The most difficult thing in mathematics often, it's sort of like, you know, proving something for the very first time. The first time you have a mathematical proof, it's often very long, very complicated, very difficult. As soon as that proof is verified, within weeks, mathematicians come up with shorter and better proofs. Isn't it interesting that they don't find the shorter, better, easier to understand proofs first? The search costs in math are huge, but so it is with human action. So when you look at past remarkable individuals, uh, you find existence proofs. You're like, wait, it is possible for a person to say be an entrepreneur and then go into politics, or it is possible to have a deep exploration of knowledge and human nature and then go and, you know, um, pr produce uh, something, something of commercial value. So, um, yeah, for me, my biggest, deepest passion has been sort of understanding our civilization. Uh, why, why is it rising? Is it falling? What are future civilizations going to be like? Since I don't think ours is going to be the last one, we're not going to be the first immortal one. I'm willing to say that, uh, eventually somehow, maybe centuries from now, maybe years from now, uh, it's going to be transformed or fall. And, uh, secondly, I, I, you know, I wanted to contribute to this process the best I could. So in my mind, the, the historical study, uh, that I've pursued in a, you know, variety of organizations, you know, for example, in a research fellow at the Long Now Foundation, where I'd looked at how some of the longest lived organizations in the world persisted, things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, German inns and Greek monasteries and, you know, uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese, uh, you know, craftsmen organizations working with the Japanese royal uh, imperial family. Um, but also, you know, I, I look at the data points of today, and that's what my consulting firm, Bismarck Analysis, is all about. I provide a perspective to my clients, and I also learn from my clients. And, uh, you know, we mostly work with technology companies, but we've done work for philanthropies, for governments. It's really, really interesting seeing this machinery up close. And I have to say, since 2017, when I founded the firm, like so many of my perspectives on various social technologies, how the world is organized, how it works, have changed. And it's always sort of enriched, right? It's enriching adding another data point to the big historical trend line and sometimes reinterpreting past events. Um, Winston Churchill was a good historian because he re wrote history in a literal sense as well, right? He, he wrote the history of World War II. And once the war was over, he wrote, of course, a flattering story about himself. But sure, don't you trust Churchill about 19th century British politics more, having known that he was a practitioner in the 40s and 50s? Like, how could someone that never practiced possibly understand? Or another example is Thucydides, uh, the account he gives of the Peloponnesian War in ancient Greece between Athens and Sparta is partially intriguing and trustworthy because he was both a general and a politician. And as an Athenian general exiled from Athens, well, you know, you never get a neutral perspective, but that's about as good as it gets, right? He's not going to be flattering of Athens and he's not going to be biased towards Sparta. And, you know, a Spartan general sure is, you know, would not be inclined to write a history to begin with. What's one or two things that you, you could share with us that you've changed your mind on or that you've sort of strongly reoriented since uh, 2017? Or what's, what's something you could share that you've strongly updated on? I think one of the strongest updates is that we are not actually serious about the energy transition. I thought at the time, oh, these are basically like anti-science and anti-human views. Anti-science is sort of like, oh, nuclear energy, technological progress is bad and only helps us destroy ourselves. We shouldn't build these power plants. We shouldn't advance any technology. Um, so that's the first sort of anti-scientific view where you distrust it. And then in the other hand, the anti-human view is like, well, you know, we should reduce human population. Like, you know, essentially we, uh, we humans are always a cancer on nature. Some solar cells are not going to change it. I used to view the barriers as basically ideological. 
I think they, they sort of still are. I think definitely there's a real environmentalist degrowth thing. But I also realized, wait, demand for energy is not increasing. Hmm. All of our wonderful energy sources that we could really develop and push much, much forward, right? Nuclear and solar are the two that are honestly my favorites that I think are just immense technical potential, immense. But even something like geothermal, to have the economics work out on nuclear and geothermal and stuff like that, right? Or let's say nuclear since geothermal is less explored, our civilization would have to spend about 10 or 100 times more energy. So in other words, I realized, wait, to make nuclear reactors cheap, you have to build a lot of them. There's going to be one or two accidents, but the accidents aren't a problem. The problem is unit economics. There's a missing country, a country of 10 billion people or 100 billion people with a unified regulatory environment that spends per capita at least as much energy as China or as much as the US. And in that country, nuclear reactor construction would be immensely profitable. And we would build hundreds of them and we would learn to build better and better and better ones and they would become cheaper. And eventually you could export to tiny countries like China or America, <laughs> but no such country exists, right? And it's not likely to exist anytime soon. So in a way we use fossil fuels because they're a fuel for an unserious and small civilization that's not climbing up towards the Kardashev scale yet. Uh, so maybe the best way to get clean energy would be to spend vastly more energy uh, than we are now, ironically. And and do you see uh, th that happening potentially any anytime soon, or or do you think we are going to remain unserious about about this for 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 a while? I mean, I think we we are sort of plodding along with a solar revolution that we almost kind of don't deserve. Like solar will eventually get good enough to make electricity cheaper. And that's the actual way to beat coal. The actual way to beat coal is to make it cheaper because no matter how well you think you regulate things internationally, there will always be a poor country that's like, you know what? We could be richer by just burning coal. And who are these people who have already burnt their coal to tell us that we can't burn coal, right? Who is this, this Germany, this Japan, the US? Why, why do they get to be rich? We're going to emit our carbon too. So this is even assuming you totally believe in global warming, you still will be like, look, you guys got your fill. Why don't we get our fill? So because of that, you have to beat coal on price. It actually has to be the best way. Um, so I think solar might push us there. And once we get clean energy because of solar, we might be more open to spending energy on, I don't know, supercomputer clusters, for example. Uh, because in this, if you take this like crazy assumption, and I acknowledge it's something we could have, and maybe we'll have a whole podcast episode on seriously, then, you know, I don't know, something like the high energy costs of uh, Bitcoin mining or whatever, or the high energy costs of uh, training runs and running the servers for the AI stuff. That's actually a feature. Like I could easily see us spending five or 10 times more energy on that. I could also easily see us spending much more energy on transportation technology um, over time, right? Especially if we reach the point where we're, um, you know, synthesizing aircraft fuel, which is uh, something that's, you know, being worked on. Uh, you could have a, a situation where the grid electricity is used to synthesize carbon neutral airline fuel because you can take carbon from the atmosphere or elsewhere from the system and just make synthetic fuel. Uh, and, you know, these are all well-known technical possibilities. It's just the economics of them are, are tricky. We'll put a cliffhanger in that and, and do a whole episode on, on, on it at, at some point. But I, I do want to segue into uh, a bit of a deep dive on, on some cer certain live players. Um, for, first, let's talk about the, the, the one of the moment, uh, Sam Altman. You know, we're, we're talking on uh, just a couple days before Thanksgiving. And by the time this releases uh, next week or so, uh, may, maybe the, the drama will be resolved, you know, changes by, by the minute. Um, but let me ask you and say, hey, a few days after, um, you know, Sam was was ousted by the board. Um, what are your most interesting reflections, either on on Sam himself, on the the, the board structure, the the nonprofit, or the surrounding sort of uh, you know public perception? W what do you think we've learned, or what do you find most interesting? Well, honestly, um, events are still unfolding, so we see how they occur. But I think it's already been proven beyond reasonable doubt that Sam Altman is a live player. Look. When you are deposed by your board, 
either a for-profit or non-profit, usually that's that. And usually the board has in advance figured out someone to receive and carry out the transition. It's not, you, you don't have a protracted search for a transitional CEO. Whoever is named by the board usually just does that. Um, in Sam's case, however, um, you know, I think he's well liked in the company, but let's also reflect. It is not enough to be very popular or well liked to get 700 out of 770 employees to sign a statement, uh, which has happened uh, in the past few days that they will quit. And, you know, I don't know, maybe go work for Microsoft unless he is reinstated. Like that's, that requires substantial support from other executives at the company. This requires team leaders talking to their teams. This requires people who are senior and junior encouraging each other to sign. Uh, this was a wonderful, wonderful, uh, like, like agenda campaign. It's like, it's like, it's, it's not that it's not tapping into real sentiments of the people at OpenAI. It's just clear that kind of thing, that kind of activity requires coordination, right? It's not correct to think of it as, uh, oh, they, they're all just sort of spontaneously following. It's like, no, this, this, this has to be something that was done in stages. And he's completely winning the PR war completely, right? He was there with the first take on the story and what's happened. Uh, following the example, you know, Greg Brockman, you know, had it only been a statement by Greg, like that would have been understood as loyalty. And then anyone I think in the Valley would have happily invested in Greg and Sam's new open AI startup, but they got the snowball rolling. And once you have this kind of open rebellion, then you flip the script on the board. It's like, you know, I shouldn't go. You should go. I don't think we've ever seen that. Yeah. And, and I feel like the for-profit versus non-profit stuff, I honestly think it's a distraction. I feel if it was a for-profit board and they made this argument to Sam, and let's say they would say, oh, you're not going fast enough, which by the way, let's remember a few days ago, all of our, uh, you know, accelerationist friends on Twitter before this drama, they were all, you know, they were all, you know, Sam Altman is slowing down AI progress. He's putting down regulations. He's a, you know, uh, he's a D cell, right? That's the term. Um, they all like him now, but you can imagine a world where there's a for-profit board. that's like, why is Sam Altman, you know, talking about safety and why is he like slowing down product release? But in that world, I think, uh, I think he could have done the same exact thing. And I think it's, uh, because he has successfully, uh, created a classical startup. Like I think people today don't understand how much early startups in the 1990s and early 2000s were, were cult-like people there genuinely believed in a mission that was carried out through a for-profit vehicle, but no one working in them was profit maximizing. Companies, software companies have become so successful that people have truly forgotten this was part of the original magic of them. Um, now, of course, everyone wants to get rich. People were intending to get very rich, but there are many ways to get rich. And some of them don't involve changing the world very much. And you know what? Working at a, a major software company today, you can easily get 300K uh, compensation. You know, if you have not been fired in the recent uh, layoffs, you get you know, select little, you know, package, compensation package, eventually a vest, you're a single double digit millionaire. And what did you do? Um, you worked on making Gmail a bit better, or you worked on making the ads on Meta a bit better. And, you know, sure, you're doing something, it's real work, I'm not devaluing it. But if you didn't do it, you're ultimately fungible, someone else would have done it. To believe a startup has a mission, which I think almost everyone at OpenAI believes is to believe that you are doing something that is not inevitable, right? And I think this is one of the deepest insights of this like early 2000s literature that I know, like when I talk to, um, to younger friends and colleagues, uh, you know, I'm actually the oldest person at my organization. Bismarck Analysis only has hired younger people or people of my age. Um, and we, we, of course, learn and our clients are, are older, uh, people in their early 20s, they've, they've not read these classic works. All they see 
is an industry that for their entire adult life has been the best way to make money. Like if you went into finance in 2012, or if you went into tech, two parallel lives financially were way better off having gone into tech. And, you know, that then results that people expect it to be basically a normal profession. There's a reason people, um, you know, people now love Microsoft because Microsoft is now been anointed by Sam Altman because he has the charisma of uh, the individual that was supposed to be pushed off the curtain off, you know, pushed off stage, uh, but wasn't. Uh, but, you know, if I ask people two or three weeks ago, it's like, okay, what's the difference between talking about a tech company and a software company? I think people don't really think of like Microsoft as a tech company in its culture, I would argue, right? There was a difference, right? And, and that difference is this kind of like irreverent, disruptive, crazy, um, dedicated view of what your company is and how it's changing the world. I, I think very few people at Microsoft believe they're changing the world. I think they believe they're providing value to shareholders and they're providing value to customers, but I don't think they believe they're changing the world. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. Live Players is sponsored by my longtime partners, SecureFrame, the only compliance automation platform with AI capabilities that helps customers speed up cloud remediation and security questionnaires. One of the things I love about SecureFrame is that it takes this time-consuming process that every company has to do in order to unlock revenue from other companies and makes it easy and simple. SecureFrame empowers businesses to build trust with customers by simplifying information, security, and compliance through AI, not wasteful human hours, by automating manual tasks related to security risk and compliance. SecureFrame allows companies to focus on growing their business. Thousands of fast-growing businesses use SecureFrame, including AngelList, Ramp, and Coda to expedite their compliance journey. I believe in them so much, I invested in them. If there is an acronym that your company dreads, SecureFrame can help. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com slash riff and mention the riff during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame. It's interesting, you know, uh, Sam has sort of sped run a, or potentially sped run a Steve Jobs arc if, if, if he comes back. Um, but the people that people often compare him to are are Elon and and, and Teal. Why don't you do a, a sort of... Um, you know, share some brief reflections on what you find most interesting or most distinct about about perhaps those three people, or how do you compare and contrast perhaps are the biggest live players in in technology or just in business uh, today? Well, each of those individuals is uh, you know worthy of several books, and you know books have been written, many articles have been written, um, many uh, you know many friends and uh, people I immensely respect have you know said far wiser things uh, than I could. But to really sketch out a few a few interesting basics, it's uh, I think Teal is extremely good at noticing when the common consensus is correct or wrong for basically bad reasons, and I do include correct here, where whenever you think that even if people are directionally making the right bet for the wrong reasons. There's some, there's some, you know, financial alpha there. There's some possibility of finding that distinction. Um, and if I were to contrast that with say Sam or, or Elon, I think it's sort of like, um, I could come up with a, a, a basic schema where, uh, where, where say like Teal might be, you know, you know, Sam Altman might hear the common wisdom and his response would be yes. And, uh, Teal's response would be no, but, and then I don't think Elon's even listening <laughs> where I think that Elon's perspective is so first principles driven that while he does recognize what is popular or not and can work with it, his decisions as to what to do next are not tied at all to the mainstream, but are following, I don't know, like a, a technology tree chart derived from basic physics or his favorite science fiction story. Um, Teal's question is like, how is the mainstream wrong and what can we do about it to make it correct, which makes him a great, uh, you know, technology investor, a great technologist, but also a great investor. And, uh, Sam, Alt Sam will like see, uh, where the enthusiasm and energy lies. And it's like, okay, can we harness this in, in even further develop it, even grow this and push it somewhere real? Like he sees like, I don't know, uh, cryptocurrencies and he's like, what about world coin? Like, what about a coin for the world 
to change the world economic system uh, to be prepared for the post-scarcity future. He sees a green energy. Hmm, great. Let's have a fusion company, right? And so on and so on. But it is downstream off of what I think he sees as viable in the landscape. Meanwhile, Elon will go and look at the space industry when everyone thinks it's hopeless. Everyone thinks it's a mature industry. Everyone thinks it's a hyper-regulated industry in go space, SpaceX. He's going to go into a crowded field of uh, lots of green companies, all of them fa that failed basically from the Obama era and try to make the electric car, but again, but have it work this time because, you know, the batteries kept getting better. So logically, eventually a car company would work, but you would have to think of it not in terms of car companies, but the raw energy potential of batteries. And also think that it's, you know, important for global warming or important for human technological development or possibly important to save capitalism. Because this is a missing um, missing side of things that people don't don't consider. Um, if you provide a technological solution to an externality produced by, say, the free market system or whatever, you've actually made yourself a political enemy uh, of people who don't like the free market system. Because every failure of the free market is political mandate to uh, do something. I don't believe all free market failures can be corrected through free market means. Like, I don't believe that. Uh, but I believe any that can probably should. Um, but on the other side, they might just view, say, global capitalism as an inherent problem, right? And this then brings me to sort of an ideological comparison of the three. And again, all I'm doing here, it's all synthesis you can get just from publicly available sources. This isn't from, you know, the special, you know, any other conversations that I might have had, uh, you know, all of them have some variant of making sense of and legitimizing their own activity in the economic sphere, which is not surprising, right? And I think the contrasts would be, I think, um, Thiel's view would probably be very closely related to preventing violence on a global scale and the abuse of individuals and the scapegoating of individuals. Elon's would be focused on species survival and why, you know, let's expand through the universe. Let's have AI not kill us. Let's like actually reach a new destiny. And, uh, you know, that's the point of the activity. And then Sam is sort of like, let's reach abundance. It's like, okay, the critics, the advocates and the critics of capitalism are right. Yes, and, right? It's like the socialists are right and the capitalists are right. Let's make capitalism work so well that we can all have UBI, right? Um, and then this, this orientation, I think, cashes out in the differences in priority. Like, yeah. I, I would expect of the three, Peter would be the most willing to back just causes that are unpopular. And Sam would be the most happy with redistribution, for example. Yeah. And like, you can, you can run with this scheme, right? You can just, you know, the crazy part is you can just take some live players seriously at what they say and think for a second about how different their actions should be. And you can just compare whether their actual actions match their stated worldview. The shocking amount is I think live players can be more honest often than the mainstream people because the live players are so strange. People never think through the logical implications of what's said. You can plainly say what you're going to do. People don't believe you will because it's not a normal thing to do. You can say why you're doing it. People still don't believe you. And uh, only after it's all already been done, they're like, wow, who could have predicted this? And I'm like, well, you could have listened to the person. <laughs> yeah. They said what, what they were going to do. It, it, it's fascinating how much that, that resonates because yeah, Sam is able to identify trends that people are excited about. And thus that makes him an amazing fundraiser and recruiter and perhaps one of our best. And, and Teal is looking for where the mainstream is wrong. And so he's willing to take big bets that make him very unlikable by, you know, many people at the time. Um, also in perpetuity, mm -hmm. uh, like, but often vindicated. Trump. Exactly. Often. Right. But you know, things like betting on Trump, betting on, uh, you know, against higher education, betting on longevity, uh, betting in charter cities, things that are, that are an anathema to, to many people, uh, and, uh, looking like a genius to, to sober minded people once, once they are proven, uh, proven correct to, to, to some degree. That's, uh, it's fascinating. I, I view 
the the core function of live players, right? Which I I think that I should uh, explain. Uh, even my long term uh, followers and listeners and you know uh, readers, uh, friends sometimes even are confused why I like so many different people, live players who often have completely incompatible ideologies or might even seem to be at odds with each other, right? Pushing society in like very different directions. The simple reality is I think of these people as absolutely necessary. They're the, um, they are the stem cells of society. All, all we are living in are institutions that were founded, you know, sometimes by great founders, sometimes by people who aren't quite great founders, who are just live players. And uh, our society would be brittle, dying, aging, and ossifying without occasional live players. It is totally, it's actually very, you know, important that society both has its bones, its uh, skin, its organs, like all of the people uh, like ourselves who, you know, mostly abide by convention and mostly do what is uh, expected and what's well-trodden wisdom, but we need stem cells or society will undergo crisis. It might seem tempting to say, oh, this or that live player, I choose that one. But unless you're a live player, there's really no strong epistemic standard you can apply to that, except for are there deviant from norm in some way? And if that's the standard, well, we, if we eliminate those, if we make that bet, um, then again, society would be static and unchanging and will become brittle and will begin to decay. Uh, and I really think that's my opinion is more life players, please. And I sometimes suspend judgment. I feel sometimes I personally might disagree with someone, but I'm like, you know, if I 60% disagree with you, the 40% you will do as a live player will still probably imp improve society. Like it'll, it'll re renovate some part that was destined to decay or destined to fail anyway. And the stuff I disagree with, well, it's probably going to be corrected later in the story by a different live player. So I'm fine. I just want to accelerate live players full stop and I endorse them and I want them uh, to thrive. And I think uh, we should be doing our best as a society to generate more of them since we are metaphorically and literally growing older and visibly older. Yeah. What would a, a live players academy consist of, or is, is that a bit of an oxymoron? Or can they not be uh, facilitated or, or discovered or, or made in some way? Well, I think it's not an oxymoron for the first generation. Uh, it might be an oxymoron for the second, third, or fourth generation, right? Because cohorts are immensely valuable. Um, it's definitely the case that I think the proof of possibility that remarkable things can be done and it being normal in your social circle to have people do remarkable things. I think that brings out the live player potential in almost everyone, right? Uh, you can go with the straightforward imitation and say, oh, you know, Elon made an electric car company. I'm going to make the electric car company. Or you can take the story of he made an electric car company. It's possible to, you know, do green tech. Or you might take the even smarter story of, uh, you know, oh, there's like physics fundamentals that are not yet priced into the market and people are not thinking about the longer uh, perspective and the long, sorry, the, the, the raw technical potential. They're just seeing what companies have come into existence already. Um, I think an academy of live players would basically bring, and, and I wouldn't even call it an academy, right? But it could be anything, you know, YC, if you explain YC today as a kind of, that it started as a uh, startup academy, it sounds very sensible. Um, it kind of makes sense. We know what a startup accelerator is. At the time, it was far less obvious, right? I think it was one of the first ones, no? Right. Or at least one yep. of the first ones that combined like deep mentorship and network creation. Well, just look at the list of that first cohort, right? What the, well, let's say Sam, who is the uh, past and maybe future CEO of uh, OpenAI, he's there, but then also Emmett Shear, the intern. Uh, yeah. CEO and like, I think yeah. uh, you know um, Alexis Ohanian, yeah, Justin Kahn, um, uh, T. Con Bernstam, uh, Michael Siebel. I, it, it, there's only 20 people. The in list that goes cohort. on. Yeah, and it, it's just people who've come to run Silicon Valley. Basically, I mean, it, it's pretty incredible. 
but then also consider something that's sort of spontaneous, right? Like the, the PayPal mafia, right? The people that create PayPal, it's like, you know, it's like Peter Thiel and, you know, uh, Reed Hoffman and uh, Elon Musk as well worked at that company, though he he's not included in the photo. Um, there is an interesting teaching training effect that happens. Um, it does have probably a high attrition rate, but this is when people, I think when people think of elite schools, they think on filtering individuals out. The presumption is the whole world wants to join your social club or your school or your board or your investment. Your job is to say no. I think that that is a corrective filtering function, but it doesn't actually select that well for live players. I think if you wanted a live player academy, you would say yes. The world doesn't yet know that they should or want to join uh, whatever organization, society, group of friends, uh, company, and you are going out and headhunting them and you are saying yes to things that say Harvard might have said no to, right? You say yes to things that Jane Street might have said no to. Everyone wants to hire an open AI engineer now. Did people want to hire open AI engineers three or four years ago? No. Yet if you did four years ago, let's say, you would probably hire a higher quality person than today. No disrespect, uh, you know, to open AI engineers. I, I love all of them. Many of them are, are, are friends, uh, you know, uh, and they're so adorable on Twitter with their heart emojis. You know, <laughs> that, that was, those yeah. great, great PR. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But still let's be real people who have been hired into open AI in the last year have made the normal bet. It is the one remaining island of prosperity in a tech industry that you could even joke was hit by like a, a tech job recession right? Like all the layoffs, right? Yeah. So totally. four years ago, though, you know, whatever you think of like, like Ilya or Rackman or whatever, these were like amazing, amazing people willing to do something that's like outside the norm. So if you had hunted them back then, that would have been both a live player move and also live player training. And I think honestly, history will, will show that OpenAI was early OpenAI was an incubator of live players. Hence why I'm from the perspective of civilization, I'm sitting happy. It's like either, you know, OpenAI continues to be a wonderful, innovative place or it breaks open and all these live players go on and create amazing new things. Either way, I think society has benefited. Either way, I think remarkable work has happened and there's way more human capital, like truly unique, remarkable human capital has been forged by this events, by these events and this, uh, this organization. Totally. It, it's, it's fascinating. Like, uh, it's like the next Google won't look like the last Google. Like if you're trying to create the next, you know, big startup, mm -hmm. you're not just going to copy a search engine. And similarly, it's like the next early Google engineer is not going to look like the current Google engineer. Like you can't just hire the same person and expect them to, to bring that same en energy you need to, you need to find sort of the, the arbitrage or, or the new talent. Um, I agree. Um, and it, it's also interesting to think about when live players kind of stop becoming live players, like maybe that, uh, you know, that same even open AI engineer, you know, four five years ago might have just been hungrier, right? They were eager to make it. Now, now if, if they're early at open AI, perhaps they made a bunch of money. Um, and you, you could look at someone like Paul Graham, right? Like Paul Graham was certainly a live player when he was creating YC, but is he a live player right now? I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, right? So, it, it, but you can get a sense that Sam Altman 10 years from now is probably still going to be a live player. Like there's something to just the durability of, of, of these people. Um, and, and also, you know, sometimes when these people who were once live players kind of, uh, check out, I mean, they, they retire partially because it's, it's not, um, two, two reasons, right? Reason number one, uh, they were moderately ambitious or, or very ambitious and their ambitions are fulfilled. Um, you have to be kind of unreasonably ambitious and have a goal that extends beyond the possibilities of what a single individual can reach yet at the same time is something you can meaningfully contribute to because if it's something that's beyond the life lifespan or energies of a single individual and impossible, then, okay, that's just like a fantasy that's futility. Um, so the life players are actually people that have greater greater, larger than life ambitions in a technical sense, right? Larger than what is possible in a life. So they don't run out of stuff to do, um, towards that goal. 
And it has secondly, also a decent feedback loop where they have some successes that make measurable progress towards that goal. So that's reason number one, they, they, they were very ambitious by almost any reasonable standard, but not larger than life. Uh, and number two is, you know, honestly, um, psychologically, it's very, very difficult to sustain yourself uh, when there is a constant stream of basically even your friends, family, even the friends and family you make after success uh, disagreeing with you, right? It can wear on people. And at some point they're like, you know, everyone hates me for doing this. I think I'm doing it for everyone. Or maybe they don't think that, but some of them certainly see themselves almost as like servants of a greater, nobler cause, right? Um, some of them are more, more um, objectivist, right? In, in their thinking, like that's also a valid way to be a live player. <laughs> no, no disrespect, but um, the, 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 if you see yourself as like helping all and you're receiving constant negative feedback, from all where the negative feedback isn't constructive criticism. It's just, you are a bad person. You are aberrant. You're not good. It eventually might get to you. Like you might have the energy in your early twenties, just for biological reasons, uh, to overpower it. And you're like later in my life, they're going to see, and they're going to know, and maybe they'll even like me, which is very insecure, but let's be honest. We, all, all of us are human beings. There's some ways we are all insecure. Even extremely highly accomplished people can be insecure. Maybe especially. And later in life, and later in life, this expected reward doesn't happen. Yeah. And then you're tempted to just retire. You're like, you know, I'm a famous actor. I'm a billionaire. I'm a successful musician. I'm a Nobel Prize winner. Time to garden. Time to, you know, uh, I don't know, go, go on the beach time to party, uh, time to spend time with my grandkids. Yeah. J Jeff Bezos. Yeah. I mean, I, I still, I still am sort of hopeful. I sort of feel like he seems like he's like being rejuvenated by love. <laughs> um, also pr probably advanced medical technology, but, but mostly by love. And I wouldn't be shocked if he like, you know, there's a way in which like, uh, you know, being very happy with someone at first you go down into the rabbit hole of the relationship, but then the happy relationship is a foundation to do even more. So currently I would agree, he looks like he's retiring, but you know, I wouldn't be shocked if they stay happy that he actually comes back and does remarkable things. Yeah. And one thing you've also covered on your Bismarck brief, uh, which is a must read for, for anyone uh, listening to this, if you don't already subscribe, but you, you have to subscribe is you, 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 you do deep dives on live players who've had a durability to them, but have evolved their the game basically from uh from capitalism to philanthropy in in some cases like soros or like B gates or like coke um wh what is it about this kind of uh transition or, or what, what do you find commonalities or what do you find so interesting about people who who make it big in business and then say okay we're gonna take that same energy and and, and do, apply it to philanthropy i mean uh, first off i think they're one of the more important shapers of american society uh, there's a very real way in which if you take an active role in philanthropic spending, uh, you can shape the very important intangibles of society. There are many, many things that can be done for profit, but political power, you know, often you spend money to, to have political power or to have cultural influence, and it's not like easily monetized. And, you know, the market does what the market does. And there are some things that are not profitable, but change society and lock in various path dependencies. And um, if you're never willing to like exit market logic into patronage, lo patronage logic, uh, that is always going to be owned by your enemies or is always going to be like less ideal, less great. If you are successful, the snowball of economic efficiency eventually gets so vast, so big, um, that while you can reinvest and like keep on creating amazing new companies, I think, uh, Elon's a great example of doing this business was a great example of doing it, right? For example, I think he is serious about blue, blue origin, for example, it might yet be his next Amazon 10 or 20 years down the line. Um, this, this is a space company as well. Um, 
it is the case that for most, it's sort of like, okay, is my life's impact 1% greater GDP for the planet? Like it's a pretty good impact, but like of these 10 choices that a wealthy society could be, which, which direction does it go in? So I find it interesting in that way. It's like, it's sort of looking at the people who have chosen sort of influence over an immediate return, because that also shows that they are not like, they're not playing a cookie clicker game, right? They're not playing a game where the number has to go up though. It's a very fun game. Anytime you want to make a number go up, it's extremely addicting and money is useful. But I think the more of it you have, the more painfully aware you become of the ways in which uh, there are things money can't buy, which isn't happiness. Okay. We can, you know, a lot of happiness can't be bought, but some happiness can be bought. It's more, there are structural things in society that no matter how much money you have, uh, you can't really just use money uh, in a straightforward way to get them. So philanthropy is actually a way to spend money to get some of them. And it's also a way to uh, advocate for values, institutions, right? They're non-monetary. Now for, um, we mentioned Soros, Koch, um, Gates. Um, I think that for Soros especially, his view was that political disaster is always possible. So if you interpret, and we could, again, talk about Soros for a whole hour, his storied career. Uh, for those who don't know, George Soros was a uh, very successful investor rising through London firms in the 50s and 70s, uh, rising then further in New York in the 80s, um, and you know, shorted famously the British pound in the 1990s, and also created the uh, Open Society Foundation, a foundation that was in 2018 barred by Viktor Orban from operating in Hungary, an organization that's actually, you know, and by the way, that drew accusations of anti-Semitism. But then the funny part was uh, the Israeli embassy was like, no, 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 no. He's actually a troublemaker. Like, look at this Palestinian stuff he's funding. <laughs> so I found that super funny, right? When Israel yeah. backs Hungary, it's like, okay, that's that's very interesting what's happening there. It's not the fact that, you know, Soros is like, you know, you know um, Hungarian, Jewish, American, right? Um, he's a, uh, he's a, uh, he, he pisses off a lot of people, even his erstwhile allies on the center left. Like in 2004, he was anti-invasion of Iraq. Um, and he's sort of become like this boogeyman also of the right, in some ways for good reasons, because he is deeply influential on all of these agendas. So why does he make the Open Society Foundation? Uh, he believes, you know, he said, uh, you know, in the 1970s, we start with the assumption that the stock market is always wrong. And he shares that same exact assumption for politics always being wrong. He thinks humans, because our minds are embedded in uh, society, in action, uh, we never have access to absolute truths. And it's extremely politically dangerous uh, when someone has access to absolute truths. And that extends to him being then anti-communist and anti-fascist. Like that's that's the Karl Popper derived theory uh, that he has. And of course, he was a student of the philosopher uh, Karl Popper in the 1950s, from who he borrows the term open society, which is a society that is continuously open to disproving its core thesis and makes no absolute guarded claim to truth and is uh, contrasted to the closed society where, you know, the political structure to be stable must make truth its enemy, therefore inevitably becomes totalitarian. And uh, his belief is that sort of like, you know, democracy, social democracy, capitalism, these are more open than other systems, but he thinks they could be even more uh, this kind of like open society that's constantly philosophically reevaluated. And that, you know, caused him to fund all of this stuff. Like in the 1980s, actually, uh, when he started doing this, he uh, funded scholarships in Eastern Europe. And ironically, President, you know, Viktor Orban, uh, Viktor Orban was one of the recipients of a Soros scholarship. So maybe that's like also a fun way to <laughs> notice how the lives of live players can cross. So like at one point, you know, you receive a scholarship, then you kind of take over Hungary, and then you ban the guy from the country. Like no more scholarships from you, okay? We don't need any Orbans. We got me, it's fine, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> and also I, I, I bet by 2018, you know, as age advances, um, you know, I've not seen many live player moves 
from Soros since the 2010s. So I suspect most of the funding is devolved to hired experts at the Open Society Foundation. I don't expect the Open Society Foundation will uh, uh, stay a uh, live player in the next 10 years. I think it will become normal. It will endorse the next Iraq invasion because you know it doesn't distinguish 100% agreeing with your political allies, let's say on the center left, versus 90% agreeing and having like a principal generator that's different. Um, and you know, Soros was pretty much an example where he, in the 1980s, he, um, he, he at least narrates this, that he had, uh, he figured out he had $25 million and that was enough. Maybe in today's money, that would be like 200 million or a hundred million. He literally was like, okay, I have enough. Uh, what should I do? And okay, let's try to shake up the politics of societies and transition them to an open, uh, to that open society direction. Yeah. Well, it, it's fascinating because and this is what typically happens with people who espouse open society or Popperian like, um, sort of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ideals is that they usually get, uh, taken over by people who use those ideals against them, who, who they themselves don't, um, don't recognize sort of free yes. speech or the sort of equality of, uh, of, of voices, but they'll say any, and they'll use that against them to overpower them. And it, it's no surprise that it feels like Soros is, uh, has been very sympathetic or in agreement with far left causes for quite some time. You mentioned the Palestinian cause, the, the BLM cause, these other causes that they themselves don't even pretend to be about uh, sort of, you know, for free speech or um, equality of uh, sort of treatment. They, in fact, endorse the standpoint theory that whoever, you know, a certain person from a certain group has a special privilege to speak, which is anti Popperian. And so it's a, it's a bit ironic that Soros both you know promotes the open society, but also has supported causes that explicitly don't. Yeah, I think I think it is. Um, you know, it's 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 a common, it's a common pattern of evolution, right? You start with a principle, you follow the principle to power, and so on. But once you become hegemonic, if your principle was countercultural, right, when it started, by the time you become hegemonic, like the dominant power, the dominant player. You might have theoretical critiques of yourself, but you're never going to have practical critiques of yourself. You don't see them. So in a funny way, if Soros is a true Paparian, when he started his journey in the 1950s, he could have predicted this. He would have been, I too do not have access to absolute truth. I will attempt to course correct society uh, with the information I have, the ways in which it's insane. And at some point, and I will not be able to tell when, uh, I will no longer be the corrective. I will be the agent of a closed society calling itself the open society. It's like actually is embedded there. There's no claim that just because you have the society, the, you know, open infinite growth mindset, maybe similar to say David Deutsch, right? Or some other Paparians, uh, that your insights are extended because of that. It's you do your best, you act, and eventually you need correctives. So maybe uh, Soros crossed that line in like the early 1990s. Maybe, you know, maybe uh, it's like, you know, fighting communism seems pretty fine. Um, you know, maybe shorting the British pound, even that's like causes economic damage, but it's like a good description that these mechanisms were bound to fail. Like the, uh, the, and after the 2010s, 2020s, I think, I think the insight's exhausted. And also, you know, old age advances and, uh, you know, we have completely biological reasons, uh, dementia sets in memory loss sets in, um, you, you cannot be as active as many hours a day. In fact, the people, uh, I would contrast say here with Henry Kissinger, who has probably due to just biological luck remained extremely active, um, and probably will until the day he dies. Yeah, no, it's tremendous. Let's uh, let, let's wrap up this uh, this first episode of, of live players, and uh, we'll go more into detail on some of these uh, next time. Uh, Samo, thanks so much for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Live Players. Please subscribe, leave a review, and check out Samo's excellent newsletter, The Bismarck Brief, for more rigorous analysis of key individuals, institutions, or industries. Live Players is a production of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Econ One Hundred and Two, with Noah Smith and Moment of Zen.